Joshua conquers the land. Chapter 24 is the last chapter of the book. And so I just want to quickly introduce the the story of Joshua uh, on this first idea. So we'll go to the first slide. Do you like that blue? Do you hate it? Let me know and uh, or let Evelyn know. She'll she'll bust my chops during lunch. All right. What was happening in Joshua's day? What was happening in Joshua's day? Our first thought. Now, this is chapter 24. This is the last chapter of the book. And I thought that as Patsy was reading it, I just reaffirmed in my own mind and my own heart. This was the story of Joshua to tell. This was the portion that we ought to have read. If we're going to capture what the story of Joshua is, chapter 24 is the great place to go. But, but Joshua, uh, we know the old song, right? Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Jericho. You got you to gotta say it low. You can't say it high. Uh, Jericho. If, uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, you got to get on YouTube. Because if you don't know what we're talking about, you probably do know what YouTube is. Uh, all of us old folks, we, we know what that song is. We didn't need YouTube for that song. But you youngins, all right? Type in Joshua and Jericho on YouTube, and you'll hear that great, great uh, gospel song. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. And what happened there? You got to sing it low now. And the walls came tumbling down. All right, all right, we know that song. We know that song. Joshua, so we know that. That's early in the book, but that's the beginning of many battles. The story of Joshua is a story of war, a story of battle. It's a story of the nation of Israel beginning as God gives them success over the nations of the promised land. God created the entire universe. He fashioned with his own hands this planet. He, with his own creative mind, created all the plants and all the animals. He, with his own hands, fashioned man and woman. He put them into a beautiful garden And that garden, most scholars would say, is this promised land where where the the two rivers that we know flow through Africa, Cush and Pishon, and the two rivers we know flow through the Middle, Middle East, Euphrates and Tigris, where those two rivers come together is in the promised land. This promised land where God uh, offered a, a, a animal as the sacrifice for Adam and Eve's sin. When they sinned against God in the garden, God created coverings for them by ending the life of a critter. This same place is where uh, Father Abraham offered up his son Isaac, although he didn't. He was ready to do it. The knife was coming down, and God's angel stopped Abram and provided a substitute, a ram, at that place in the promised land, Mount, um, well, Mount Zion, Mount, what is it done? Yeah, Mount Moriah, which is in Mount Zion, Jerusalem. Jerusalem, And Abram's up there, and, and God makes a substitute so that we n- need not die. 2,000 years after Abram, God, on that same mountain, offers up his one and only son, Jesus, the substitute for your sin and for my sin, that we need not die. A substitute took our place. And, and so this promised land is precious in God's heart. And this promised land was promised to Abram and his seed, namely Christ. And Christ will reign the earth one day in our future. Christ will reign the earth one day from his capital city in this promised land. So this place, this real estate is precious to God's heart. He gives it to Abram's descendants as we wait for the Messiah to come. And certainly on Palm Sunday, the Messiah comes into his capital city and they hail him as what? On Palm Sunday, they, they say to Jesus, what? The king, Hosanna, the king of David has come into his city. And so we'll, we'll reflect on that. But, but the promised land is being given to the nation of Israel in Joshua. We might dare say that up until Joshua's story, It is called the children of Israel. And Joshua transitions the people from the children of Israel to now the nation of Israel. And so the nation of Israel began around 1400 B.C. as Joshua brings the people into the promised land. Moses had just died, the end of Deuteronomy, and Joshua, his second in command, takes over. 
So Joshua, the book, is largely a, a, a story of battles. Begins with Jericho, goes to Ai, and then they have this campaign of, of dividing the land. They enter through the center, and then they conquer the south, they conquer the north, they take half of the nations at one time, and it's a divide and conquer strategy. And, and the rest of the book really is then settling the land. There are large portions of this book where, where the different tribes of Israel settle in portions of the property. Judah goes to the south, and, and Dan settles in the center, and then they have trouble, they go up to the north. And, and so there's, there's this settling of the land, the 12 tribes of Israel become a nation once they enter the promised land. And as Joshua is preparing for a transition, he is elderly, he's, he's uh, it says 110 years old, verse 29, he dies at 110. But he's settling the people as he transitions to retirement, every one of them sitting under their uh, fig tree and their, their olive branch, and they're all at peace. And he settles them down, and in verse 11, he reminds them of where they came from and where they are now. We took you over the Jordan, verse 11. And do you remember, uh, just for fact, uh, how did they cross over that Jordan River? Do you recall? How did they cross over the Jordan? They stepped into it, and as the Levite priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant tipped their little tippy toes in the Jordan River, the entire river backed up and they walked across on dry ground. This is to say, entering the promised land is, is the same experience as, as leaving Egypt. Remember, Moses led them across dry ground in what bed of water? The Red Sea. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. Now Joshua leads them across the Jordan on dry ground, verse 11. So they crossed the Jordan River. They came to Jericho, and the leaders of Jericho fought against you. Also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Patsy, awesome. Well done on naming all of these folks. Yeah, she did an amazing job. And yeah, all of those nations. These are the nations who are robbing from God. This is God's land. God gives it to whom he wants. And uh, so he's defeating those armies. Notice the end of verse 11. I gave them into your hand. So, so Joshua's reminding the people, the Lord is the one giving you this land. It wasn't your might that gave you rest. It was God's might that gave you rest. So that's what's happening throughout the entire book. And point number one, I just wanted you to understand context of where we are. Again, about 1400 BC. What I want you to think about as we end up on point number one is that God gave you deliverance, not over a Girgashites, thank God, right? No Girgashites in your life, no parasites, but there might be some parasites in your life. There might be some sins that have been eating away at your soul. And God did give you victory over those things. And looking towards our future, God can give you victory over those things. And what we need to do is thank the Lord. Only he was able to deliver you. And only he deserves the thanks. So, so we need to give that and be reminded of that. Remind yourself daily of what God delivered you from. Number two, uh, at the end of 11, we already said, I gave them into your hand. God gave them into your hand. Verse 12, I sent the hornet before you. This is God talking to them. The hornet, the hornet. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you, the two kings and the Amorites. And it was not by your sword and not by your bow. And this is where I come to our second idea, that success comes from God. Whatever types of success you're experiencing, battles over sin or uh, intellectual struggles, academic challenges, students, when you're struggling with math and something finally clicks, that's the Lord giving you hope over that. If you're in some uh, problem at work, trying to solve a problem at work and God, something clicks in your mind, it's the Lord giving you that success whether it's God blessing his church and his church having success, 
We experience success because of God's lavish and generous grace. And we see that in in verse 11. I was the one that gave them into your hand. Verse 12, I sent the hornet before you. And I love this concept. I love this concept that in their physical battles with other human beings, God went ahead of them and God stirred up. That's what hornets do, right? Hornets stir up and, and throw everything into confusion. Were you ever mowing your lawn and you, you stepped into one of those ground hornet nests and, and you just run for cover, right? You run for the door because these things are faster than you and you try to outrun them. And man, it throws you into confusion. That's what the Amorites, Girgashites, Perizzites, Jebusites, all these ites, that's the state of their soul before Israel even comes in contact with them. We know this because in the battle of Jericho, remember beforehand, weeks ahead of time, Joshua had sent what? Two spies to go spy out Jericho, get a sense of the lay of the land. And these two spies end up staying over with Rahab. And remember what Rahab says to the two spies. This is earlier in the book, chapter 2, chapter 3, 4, somewhere in there. Two. Very good. You're the master. And what does she say to them? She says, Our hearts melted away when we heard what your God has done for you even before now, how he led you out of Egypt, how he gave you success over the Amalekites and the Moabites and all of these ites on the opposite side of the Jordan River. Our hearts melted away when we heard that you were coming this way. And that's the hornet. That's the stir in their souls before the people of Israel even get there. That's the end of verse 12, where it says, uh, let me find it once again, it wasn't by your sword or by your bow, it was by my hornet. And guys, I think we need to apply that to us when there is success, when we experience deliverance. It isn't by our sword, it isn't by our bow, it isn't by our cash, it isn't by our brilliance, it isn't by our our handsome or beautiful good looks, it is by the Lord, his hornet, going on ahead, preparing the way. When someone comes to faith, it wasn't the cleverness of your message. This is why a lot of Christians don't share their faith, they're worried, man, am am I going to know what to say? You could be saying babble, and God would be ministering to that person's heart. We need to get over our fears, because his spirit goes before our bow or our sword or our mouth, right? The Lord ministers to hearts before we even attempt to minister to any heart. And we just need to to wrap ourselves in, it is God that grants success So, O Lord, would you lavish me again in your amazing grace. And guys, a takeaway I think we need to say at the end of point number two, we need to actually physically get out a pen the way Joshua did, and we need to catalog the many things that belong to me because of God's kindness, the many things that happened to me because of God's tender mercies, count our blessings and actually record them. It's been a joy to us on Thanksgiving. Every year we have a journal and we, we uh, write down what we're thankful for that happened that year. And we spend some portion of Thanksgiving Day writing those down. But, bef- but uh, even without the, the good experience, the good mental work of actually making a list on that Thanksgiving Day, what we enjoy even more is going back and reading the rest of the book. What did God do in our lives in 2017? What did God do in our lives in 2010? And the kids love that as much as mom and dad love that. So in some way, recording the things that God's done, the kindnesses God has shown you. Verse 14 and 15, idea number three. It says here in 14 and 15, that the fear of the Lord, uh, I'm sorry, that we should, therefore, because of the success God gave, verse 14, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him with sincerity and with faithfulness. 
and put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river in Egypt. Serve the Lord. If it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in the, the land that you now dwell. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so this third idea, I think Joshua is just pressing them. My family, we talked. Before I came out here this morning, we talked. We've decided in our hearts, we're going to stick to the Lord. The things in our life that want to tempt us away, we're going to actively chase those things out of our hearts. Those idols, love of money, love of time, love of romance, love of all things material. We're going to chase those dreams out of our heart because we're devoting ourselves to the Lord and we're putting away idols. And I think the way we can understand our third idea in 1415 is that we're invited to fully enact our faith. Don't go halfway with the Lord. Don't go halfway. Don't make God part of your life. Yeah, I, I asked Jesus into my heart. I'm so glad he's a part of my life. Don't let God be a part of your life. Joshua's saying God refuses to be a part of your life. He could be all of your life. He could be all of your dreams. He could be all your heart. Or he could be none of it. God wants hot hearts. He wants cold hearts. He does not accept lukewarm hearts. You could be on his green pastures on his side of the fence. You could be in the dirt on this earthly side of the fence. But God doesn't take people that ride the fence. That's what Joshua is saying. And Jesus is saying the same thing. When Jesus says to us in Revelation chapter 3, he says to you, I wish to spit you out of my mouth. This is where I love the King James, right? What does the King James say? I want to spew you out of my mouth. I'm thinking of Garth, right? If you're going to spew, spew into this, right? And and so uh, from Wayne's world. And that's God. God wants to spew lukewarm people. People that love their money as well as love their God. People that love their romance and think about God very infrequently. God wants unmingled hearts. And he refuses to share you with your sin. He refuses to put up with the love triangle. Put that stuff away and cling to him. Or put him away. I guess I'm not going to see you next week. Put him away and go serve your idols. But don't have both. There's no room for the, the, the swirled ice cream, right? The, the chocolate and vanilla, right? You've got to pick. Make up your mind already. All these people with their Neapolitan ice cream. Make up your mind. Okay, the chocolate, the strawberry, vanilla. Do they even make that stuff anymore? Whenever mom and dad broke that out, I was always disappointed. Like, come on do something already that's what joshua is saying that's what actually god god is saying this joshua is just the mouthpiece for all of this and that's what he's saying if it is evil in your eyes to serve the lord well guys is it is it a wicked thing to serve the lord jesus christ is that a wicked thing if it is put him away Make up your mind. Run with him or run with the devil. Don't get to run with both. This is why we need to chase away that cartoon mentality. I remember watching the the cartoons Saturday mornings and the little angels on both shoulders and whoever it was would always be listening to the red little devil and the white little angel and you'd always have to be in tension. Which one am I going to listen to? We don't need to make up our mind who we're going to listen to. We've made up our mind. Choose this day whom you're going to serve. I don't need to listen to the devil and his temptations. I've already chosen the Lord. Have you? Have you chosen the Lord? Have you today chosen the Lord? Now guys, I'm talking to mostly Christians. Who's Joshua talking to? People that already left their slavery in Egypt. They already decided to follow the Lord out of Egypt. 
They already saw the Lord's many provisions in the desert. They've seen how God gave them success in this promised land over their enemies. They've settled in houses, we're about to read, houses that they didn't build and enjoying vineyards that they didn't plant. They've seen the grace of God. And Joshua's still asking them today, today choose. Well, they already chose 40 years earlier when they left Egypt. But today, choose. And that's what says to me, Christians, we are being invited to choose once again. Choose once again. Let today be a day where you choose. A lot of us struggle with uh, assurance, right? Um, uh, am I truly saved? And, and some people in the front cover of their Bible have the date that they received the Lord. Maybe they added to it the date they were baptized, publicly declaring their faith in Jesus Christ. And a lot of people have that, and a lot of people find comfort in knowing that, having that concrete date in their mind. And some of us who don't have that concrete date struggle, like, did I really choose? Or am I just fooling myself? Joshua says to you, if you don't have a date, if you have no today, let today be that day that you chose. And even in your mind, like, quiet yourself and say, God, I can't remember the day I chose you. I can't remember the day we began this beautiful dance. But today, I choose you anew. I'm rededicating myself to you. I'm, I'm focusing myself on serving you and you only. Today, I've chosen you only. And you need to get out a pen because today is January 31st, 2021. Today's your day if you don't have one. Let today be that day. Enact your faith fully. No half ways. Shake loose the false gods in your life. Get rid of them. Empty those empty things out of your heart. There ain't room for Jesus if you're full of yourself. You gotta empty yourself so that you could be filled with him. In our fourth idea, verses 16 through 18, we, we see this need of, of recognizing, publicly recognizing, and the people respond to his invitation. He said, today choose. And what did the people say? Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve all other gods. For it is the Lord our God who brought us and our fathers up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the peoples through whom we passed. The Lord drove out before us all the peoples, the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore, we will serve the Lord. What did Joshua want them to do? Today, serve the Lord. What have they just declared? We're going to serve the Lord. Why? Why? Because we recognize all the things he's done for us. What did those false idols do for us? That carved wooden statue, that bronze serpent. Okay, they did worship that thing at one point. The golden calf. What, what did those carved things get them? Got them a whole world of hurt. Anytime they turned to false things, they got into trouble. When they gave themselves over to God, God blessed them and God gave them success. And so they've recognized what God's done for them. If you don't do number two, you're never going to take seriously number three. And number four, forget about it, right? You're not going to confess his power if you've not, in your heart, cataloged the many things he's done for you. So we've got to do number two. Joshua reminds them of number two. We've got to do number three. All right, today I'm going to choose. And then I speak it out. We only say what our heart creates. Out of the heart we speak. And so in order to confess, I need to be able to uh, process the many things God's done. So they, they the people, 16 through 18, catalog the many things God's done for them, and they conclude, verse 18, we will serve the Lord. He 
is our God. So they recognize and they confess God's grace. God's grace was the power that drove us to the successes we've experienced. Finally, in our last portion, Joshua says to them something I, I, I would hate to ever have to say to you. You said this, but you're not going to do it. Have we ever done that? Like, you made up your mind in church. Like, there was a song we sang, a prayer that got said, or, or something in the sermon that touched your heart, and you said, Lord, today it changes. Every day this week, I'm reading my Bible. It, it's new. We're beginning something new. It's going to be great. I'm going to conquer that temptation that's been kicking me. I'm going to overcome it. And you, you make up your mind Sunday. And then you go out, and how's Monday go? A little rocky. How's Tuesday go? Pretty stressful. Because, man, we have those vices that we run to. We have those false gods that, that comfort us. It's like comfort food, right? This, this idol of sex, this idol of money, it's the mac and cheese of the sin world. It is comfort, man. So when I'm hurting, I, I run to that vice. I lash out at someone, right? If I'm feeling bad about myself, I make someone else feel bad. And that, that, that comforts, consoles me. Or I turn on Jerry Springer, that calms me down. I feel like my life is such a wreck, and now I see it's not as wrecked as that. All right? Is he even on yet? Hopefully not. Oh, man. Heaven help us all. That comfort food, right? That stress reliever, you run to it. You run to your, whenever you're feeling stressed, you run to your bank account. Oh, man, I'm all right. It's okay after all. Uh, we'll see. I'm not, I'm, all right, enough of that. We can't be running to those comforts. But Joshua says, you guys say this today, but you're going to be running to that comfort food. You're going to be running to that idol that, that uh, gave you some happiness, gave you some romantic pleasure, some, some uh, wealth uh, pleasure, some experience that pleasured you, some pride stroked your ego. You're going you're to be comforted by those empty things. And he says to them, you're gonna. So don't be saying to God, then be saying to Baal tomorrow. Baal's a false god. Don't be saying to God, I love you today. And then tomorrow be saying to, to the God of time, oh, Kronos, I love you. I love you, pocketbook. I love you, daytimer. You give me such comfort, daytimer. Daytimers are okay. I joke with people. I only do what my phone tells me to do. It beeps, I go do it. You know, the daytimer on the phone. It's a useful tool, but we should never become its tool, right? And whether we serve time, money, pleasure, whatever, it's a sobering thing when we covenant with God. That's what Joshua's saying. It should scare you straight. It should scare you serious. It should, it should sober you that you've said to the Almighty Creator, yes, Lord, I'm yours. And then to be tempted tomorrow to run to something else. So wake up. Don't run to that empty thing. Stick with the Lord. Don't be like the people of Israel where you are going to forsake the Lord. Don't do that. And we've got some power they don't, they don't have. Because where was God in the Old Testament? In heaven, in glory, enshrined on his throne. Where's God today? Still there, but where else? In my heart. And so while Joshua says to them, you say it, but you're not going to do it. A lot of us, that's true. However, we have power and access they don't have. The God, Holy Spirit, resides within our heart. The living God. So while the carved God of TV while the graven image of money and secular success and the corporate ladder and all of these visual things are outside to be seen, for you, Christian, you're different. You're different than the people Joshua was speaking to. 
Because you trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin, His Holy Spirit has entered your heart. And He's a trainer like no other. Now He'll sit quiet if you don't ask Him for help. But when you ask for help, He's there to push you to success, to be the hornet even within your own heart, to overcome the obstacles that you face. You have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. And while you've made covenant today to trust in the Lord and to serve Him only, you have power beyond your own gumption and bootstraps. You have God Himself residing in your heart. And you can in His strength, not with your sword or your bow, but in His strength you can. And I am saying what Joshua didn't say. I'm not just saying you can. Listen to your shepherd. You will. You will have success over your temptations. You will drive out the graven images in your heart. You will overcome the things that have been so comfortable to you but are sinful. You will. Because God is able. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all we ask or even imagine. And when we go to God for help, He loves being a helper. Now we've just spent two years in John's Gospel. In John, what does Jesus call the Holy Spirit? The helper, the comforter. He is there to help you. Ask Him. He is there to turn Joshua's frown into your smile. When Joshua says to them, you're not able. Your pastor is saying to you, by the truth of the New Testament, you are able. You can, not in your power, not in your pride, in the spirit that resides within you. Access him. Use him. He's there for you to comfort you and to help you to drive you to be the visible image of Jesus Christ in a world that needs to see Jesus in 2021. They saw him back in his earthly ministry 2,000 years ago. The world sees him today when they see us overcoming by the power of his Holy Spirit. Lord, we love you and we're thankful for you. Your truth gives us peace it gives us comfort. It gives us joy. It gives us challenge. It shakes us. Because for so many of us, we have the fence riding. We've put the saddle on the fence and we're riding this world and the next. And you've shown us it's not good. It is odious in your sight, Lord God, when your people try to play you halfway. We'll, we'll take God for heaven. And we'll take our idols for this world and its pleasures. And we can't. My brothers, this should not be so, James said about your tongue. And Joshua is saying that about our whole life. I can't say, oh Jesus, I love you on Sunday. And then say to Asherah, the God of sexual pleasure, I love you on Monday, on Tuesday. We cannot say, oh Father, I love you on Sunday and on Wednesday say to Baal, the God of prosperity, oh, would you give me more stuff because I've worshipped you? Brothers, sisters, we cannot. We cannot serve these false and empty, aimless things when the Creator God invites you into His love. Help us, Lord, to shake these things free to cherish you and incline our hearts towards you. We'll say with the hymn writer, our hearts are prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. And we'll agree, so here's my heart. Take, seal it. Seal it for your courts above. And while your people think on this, show us one thing, two things, five things that are keeping us from enjoying you more, pleasing you more. As these things come flooding into our minds, we shake them out. 
It's the dust we've collected. We've taken it outside and we've shaken it off. And we come back to be with you, Lord God. You are the most beautiful thing in the world. You are the most wise friend we'll ever have. You're the most compassionate, giving up your own life so that we could experience life in its fullest. And while we surrender these things to you, we begin to live that full life the way you intended. Lord, I also think of my friend here that doesn't yet have a friendship with you. They've not chosen this day or any day whom they would serve. And so they're not in a friendship with you, but, but they could be. They could be by asking Jesus into their life. Not to be a part of their life, to be, to be all of their life. You are our life, as Peter says. Friend, to begin this, all you need to do is choose today whom you're going to serve. Whether it be the God that gave you all of these successes, whether it be the God that gave you forgiveness of sin, or whether it be these empty things that lay husks around you. I would invite you to choose Jesus Christ, the God and creator of all things. Choose him. Bring him in. Welcome him to his throne on your heart. It's a simple thing to do. It's a lifetime to get right. A lifetime to work itself out into every part of who you are. But it begins today when you choose him. So say to him, Lord God, I choose Jesus as my Savior. He died on his cross to take away all of my guilt. He rose again on the third day. Would you give me eternal life because I trust that Jesus lives? Would you give me the gift of your Holy Spirit because your son died and was risen all for my sake? And if you humbly ask, if you do what Joshua says, choose today whom you're going to serve. If you do it, you will experience life, joy that's unspeakable, joy that bubbles our hearts to sing as we're about to. And so, Lord God, fill our lips with the joy that's in our hearts. In our hearts, for all the things you've done, our hearts are, are bubbling up, springs of living water, let it come out as we worship you in song. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.